Good. Are you all excited about your upcoming test? It's so exciting, let me tell you. Um, if you have not checked out online yet, um, the study guide for the test is up. And um, it basically covers everything that's not covered in your annual edition study guides. So it has all the terms and ideas that I'd like you to kind of be familiar with and know for the test, and you can use it and go through it and make sure you you know everything you need to know. Um, the test is all multiple choice, and um, it, uh, you will need Form 882E, which is the long, skinny, green guy, okay? So make sure you bring that, and a pencil, and that's all you'll need, okay? Uh, uh, 50 or 66. It depends how I write it, because it's worth 200 points, so I have to do something that's divisible into 200 for the multiplication. Sometimes it's 50, sometimes it's 66. Um, so I'm not sure, but one or the other of those. Most people finish it easily in less than the amount of time you have in a class. So most, I have very few people that are here more than an hour, and nobody's ever needed extra time. Okay? Um... At this point, let me make sure everyone has copies of the genetics key terms with definitions. Anybody in need of this? I'm not sure I actually have four more. Let me see. Who else? Here is the sign-in sheet. Go ahead and put your name on that one. Who else? Hello, hello, hello. Um, one's my last one. Okay, um, it's time to put your phones away, please. I don't know if you... It might be time in the semester for me to remind you that I don't want your cell phones out and being used in my class because um, I seem to have a lot of people forgetting this in my classes here in week five. So um, please don't use your cell phones in my class and please don't keep them on the desk. Now, let's go ahead and get started. The last thing that we did before I, uh, the, at the end of last class was to uh, talk about some exceptions to Mendelian genetics. And the last thing we did was talk about sex-linked traits, and we talked about color blindness. Um, we talked about hemophilia in Europe's royal families. And I promised you I would get back to... Um, the example of the Labrador Retrievers, okay? And um, so we've talked about several exceptions to Mendelian genetics. Why don't we review them? What are some of those exceptions? Go ahead and look in your notes. What are, we, we're kind of going through a list of things that don't follow the Mendelian pattern. What was the first one? What was it polygenic inheritance? Good. What else? Pleiotropy. Keep going. Baldness is an example of what type of inheritance? Sex linked. Okay, so we'd say that. What, what else did you say? Codominance. Nice. Um, yeah. So if it's dis, if it's continuous um, uh, variation, then it's not Mendelian as well. Okay. And along with codominance, we did something else with ABO blood system. What is it? Oh, my God. Yes, it's multiple little series. Okay, so those are the ones we've gone through um, so far. Okay. Now, another type of, um, of uh, inheritance that's extremely important, as it turns out, uh, more important than anyone thought because of the small number of genes that human beings actually have, uh, are what are called regulatory genes. Okay, so there are some genes that act as switches, and you should write switch next to regulatory genes because the film I'm going to show you on Monday, um, at least in the latter part of the class, talks about them, calls them switches. They have several different names. Um, some people call them transcription factors. That term is used in one of your readings. So switches, 
and transcription factors are all, and, and regulatory genes, are all the same thing. They're all terms of the same thing. Um, now, a good example of regulatory genes, a simple example, is the case of Labrador retrievers, which come, as you probably know, in three colors. Uh, they come in black, brown, and Carlos, or blonde, or whatever you want to call them. Um, yellow is what they usually call it, but Carlos is over on the, on the right. And this coat color arises through an interaction between alleles of two different genes, okay? One of them produces melanin. Because I don't want this here. Okay. And that allele, uh, or that gene will designate B. Okay. Now, allele capital B, which means it's what? When we write it with a capital, what does it mean? It's dominant. Will result in a black dog and is dominant to small b which means it's recessive, that can result in a brown dog if it is what? If it's recessive, it has to be what to get the brown dog? Homozygous, yeah. So that means you have to have two copies of the recessive to end up with brown. If you're heterozygous, you're black, okay? Because it's dominant. Everybody following? Okay. Another gene and this is the switch gene, affects the deposition of the pigment in the individual hairs. So what this means is the second gene, which we'll call E, can block the deposition of the pigment. Okay. Now, capital E allows the pigment to be deposited, so that's the dominant trait. And in that case, it allows your dog to be brown, brown, <laughs> to be brown, to be brown or black. Okay, if it's the recessive homozygote, meaning two of the small lowercase e, the gene will block the melanin and result in a yellow dog. Okay, that is an example of regulatory genes. Okay, um, do you want an extra credit assignment? Let's take five minutes to do an extra credit assignment. Okay. Here's your extra credit assignment, which is way harder than anything that's on the test. Uh, what I would like you to do is uh, mate two uh, dogs, two Labradors um, that are dihybrids for both of these traits. Okay, that is to say, the melanin gene and the switch gene. And I want you to, use, to, to, to create a Punnett square and tell me the percentage or ratio of their offspring that are black and brown and yellow. Actually, let's do several questions. Question number one, okay, so it's dihybrids. And here's a clue, since you're probably wondering what that meant. We talked about this last time. You don't remember what's dihybrid mean. It means that you are heterozygous for both of these traits, okay? So that's critical. You got dihybrid parents. Both parents are dihybrids. My number one question is what color are the parents? Number two is your Punnett square showing the mating. And number three is the ratio of black to brown to yellow offspring. And if you can get all three of these questions correct, I will give you seven free points. And you haven't taken your first test yet, but trust me, you need them, these points. Yes? Second question is the Punnett square. So part of your your score on this is your ability to create a correct Punnett square for these for these traits. Okay, remember we're dealing with two genes here. That's why we call it dihybrid. Parents are heterozygous for both of the traits for B and E, and those are the those are the initials you should use for in your Punnett square. Azure. Okay, so um, both parents would have to be black. 
No, they're not. It's, you're supposed to write this down. Yeah. Don't don't answer the questions out loud. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just write. I want your name on the top of a piece of paper. I want you to write it down. I want you to do a Punnett square. I want you to do it all to the best of your ability. I'll give you part credit for anything you get correct. And I'm. I want a piece of paper with your name on it, even if you don't know anything. In fact, I want a piece of paper if you don't know your own name. And give it your best shot. Feel the force within. You know the answer. You can do it. Put your back into it. <laughs> That's my favorite song, actually. <laughs> Love that song. I hear that song once, and it's like I can't get it out of my head for a week. <laughs> I know, I have really bad taste in music. Okay. So you got two, you got dihybrid mom, dihybrid dad. They mate, they have offspring. I want to know the ratio of the offspring and I want a Punnett square that shows that ratio. Yeah? When you have, like, I don't understand the last part. When you have a little E, is it saying that, like, it's going to block out the brown and the black just to make the. It makes it, it makes the, do, it makes the offspring yellow. Even if it's recessive? Well, it has to be homozygous recessive. Right? Recessive homozygote, meaning there's two little e's. So if it's recessive, you've got to be homozygous for it to work and cause the yellow dog. Yeah. And you can use your notes. At first, I thought this was one of your jokes where you're going to like, ask us to do this in real life. Oh, yeah, it did sound like that, didn't I? It was like you had to mate two dogs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I should have said, take a piece of paper out and put your name on the top. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, yeah, sometimes I, I, I'm so used to joking, I can hardly be serious when I try. But this is good for you. It's like active learning. You're used to me just talking, so you're probably like passive. You're just, you know, he'll talk. I don't have to think. Now we get you to think a little bit, which is great. And it's extra credit, so no matter how badly you do, it will not hurt you. Uh, hang on to it, and I'll come and collect them in a few minutes. We need to give everybody a few minutes, because if you, if you actually can figure this out and do it, it's going to take you probably close to five minutes to write everything out. So you, if, you're th if you don't know the answers, you might want to take the time to kind of think about, about it, because I think you can figure it out. Remember the Punnett squares I showed you in class? Those are, those are important here. Remember I showed you a Punnett square that had one trait, and I showed you a Punnett square that had two traits. Right? And we have two traits here. Right? So there's a clue for you. I used to bring Carlos to class, actually, when I did this. But that got out of control. Nobody can focus. They all just want to pet Carlos. Carlos is passed on now, I'm afraid. He's in Labrador heaven with Charles Darwin. <laughs> Don't feel bad if you can't get it. I gave this problem to a UCLA class I taught one time, and only 20%, 20 percent, 20-ish percent got the whole thing right. I might have given you a little bit more clues, but it's not easy. can't figure anything out, draw a picture of a dog, and if it's good, I'll give you a point.
peas in the dog, the big E, the dominant P makes it long, and the double E makes it short. Mm -mm. Oh, see? Recessive homozygote blocks deposition and yellow coat results. Okay. I think you actually have all the information you need at this point. But if you have a question, I suppose, as an educator, I should answer it. What's the answer? Can I have the points for free? Am I passing your class? So exciting, this problem. Yeah, Carlos, Carlos would eat anything. He would eat anything. One time I was walking him down the block, and I didn't have him on the leash, and he ran into this bar to eat the peanuts on the floor that somebody had thrown. Not not the peanuts, but the shells that somebody had thrown on the floor of the bar. I had to drag him out of the bar in the middle of the day. One time he knocked the bag of food down on the floor of the kitchen and ate half the bag. I got home and he was just like lying in this comatose state on the floor. See anything. An eating machine. Thank you. A few more minutes. way harder than anything on the test. How many people want more time? Okay. We can't take forever. At some point, you ha some of you might have to admit you don't know the answer. How about I start walking around, and if you're ready to give me your, your answer, you can give it to me. If you want a little more time, I'll come back. Not ready? It's 
purely voluntary basis. Ooh, like the Carlos picture. Hello, 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 hello. Oh, unhappy face. A sad face. Don't be sad, it's okay. Some people are hiding their sheets from me. I have to grade them, I have to see them. <laughs> Did you do one? No. Oh, just put your name on a piece of paper. Well, actually, did you sign in on the on the on the attendance? Yeah, I just got it. Oh, right, right, okay. Right. Anyone else? This is not right, but I will be your It's beautiful. You got it right. You did already. I did, and I and yes, I have all yours. I have this whole row. I'm going down the wrong row. That's the problem. out of seven. So you did very well. How are you? That's okay. Don't worry about it. Put your name on it. How do you have that? You're pretty smart. Answers every question. Oh, terrible. You couldn't see it. Oh, oh. it's not. No, no, no. That's not. It. She's, she's, she's devious and clever. Uh, okay. Do I have everyone's? If I don't have it, please give it to me. Thank you. That's good. I'll give you a point for that one. <laughs> you in the doghouse. I like that. That's great. <laughs> Uh, la 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 la. Wait, Maria. Did you give me ratios? For the last part of the question? With the black to brown to yellow? Thank you. I have everyone's paper now. Well, congratulations. I don't. I do. Is there anybody still working on this? Please speak now or for forever hold your peace. You're done. You won, you won the competition. Uh, oh. You got, la la, I think you're about a three. Maybe a, well, three probably. My assistant grades them and my assistant's kind of mean. Um, <laughs> All right, how does it work? Well, you have two traits, so that means your Punnett square should have how many cells? 16. 16, as it did with independent assortment. Okay, figuring that out was a primary step to getting the whole thing correct. You had to do a Punnett square with 16 cells. Um, the correct Punnett square, wait, is it here? Is here. It looks like this. So these are your possible genetic contributions. First of all, both parents are black because black is the dominant color. And if they're hybrid, if they're if they're heter, if they're all right, if they are heterozygous for the switch gene, it doesn't turn off the color. So that means they're both black. 
Um, these are the possible contributions for each of the parents, uh, the gametic contributions. I mean, we could put little eggs and sperm, but basically this is dad and this is mom. You fill out the squares and these are the colors. Anytime you've got heterozygous or homozygous dominant, you end up with a black dog. If you have homozygous recessive for color, they're brown. And if you have homozygous recessive for the switch gene, they're yellow. So the answer is 9 to 3 to 4. I didn't look really closely at everyone's, but I believe about three-ish people got it right. Okay, It's not an easy problem. Um, but the, the only difference, I mean, conceptually, there's, there's, this is a point to sort of going through this exercise. The only difference between this and the 16-cell independent assortment Punnett square that I showed you is that this only has three results instead of four phenotypes, right? And that's because the switch gene either turns everything on or turns everything off, basically. So you have three phenotypic results, a Punnett score with 16 cells, so your ratio only has three phenotypes. Nine to three to four is your answer. Okay? It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not an easy problem. Um, but uh, hopefully you understand now how you would do it. Okay? Hopefully you understand now how you would do it. All right. Future extra credit opportunities will be given to you. Maybe some of them won't even be that hard. Okay, uh, last but not least, a deviation from Mendelian genetics relates to how the environment can influence the phenotype. Okay, so phenotypic results are not solely the result of genes. The environment can play a direct role in the phenotype. Okay, and that's something that's non-Mendelian. Um, Here's me after three minutes in the sun. Okay. That's an environmental influence on the phenotype. We've already talked about tans or sunburns or whatnot. Um, here's another one. How many people in this room know what this flower is? Yeah. Do you know what it is? Like, can, do you know the name of it? Not do you recognize it, like, have you ever seen it before? It's a hydrangea, recently in the news because Madonna hates them. Um, you may have missed that story, but this is that flower. What does anyone know? We don't have many people who are who are up on flower types. Interestingly, um, I almost offered that as the extra credit question. Good thing I didn't. Uh, does anyone know what the environmental influence on the phenotype of this flower is? It's something to do with the flower. Of course, without sunshine, the plant would die. That goes without saying. But the color of flower, the color of this flower is influenced by the acidity of the soil. So they range in color from a pale pink to a dark purple, and their color is determined by how acid the soil is or how alkaline the soil is. So you can change the color. If you've got these in your front yard, you can change the color of this flower by simply changing the acidity of the soil, which some people do if you're really into gardening. Um, certain fertilizers will do it. Uh, you can also do things like, uh, some people like bury pennies and stuff like that near the plant. I think that will also work to modify the acidity. Um, here's a creature. How many people know what this is? Yeah. She, the story was that uh, somebody gave her a bouquet of hydrangeas at, when she was making a public appearance. And she thought the microphone was off, and, and she, like, turned to a friend and said, I hate hydrangeas. And, like, the world heard this, like, right after the person handed her the flowers. <laughs> smiles and says thank you. Yeah, smiles and says thank you in, like, this really gracious way. And then she turns to her friend when the person's gone, and he's like, I hate hydrangeas. Right? And, the, and this was caught on film, and you can, you can watch it on, online if you want. It's, 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 you know, not exactly the greatest movie of all time, but uh, it did make the rounds momentarily as a meme. Um, you know, as if we needed more proof what a bitch Madonna is. Uh, <laughs> I love Madonna. Lo listen, I didn't just say that. It slipped out of my mouth. Flew out of my mouth. Uh, here's another creature whose phenotype is affected by environmental factors. What creature is this? A oh, yes, a flamingo. And how is this creature's phenotype affected by the environment?
yeah, shrimp give it its red color. Okay, and in fact, shrimp and other crustaceans, basically food sources that have what are called carotenoids in them, are responsible for red coloring in the animal kingdom in general. Um, so shrimp is one source of <coughs> food for animals that are red, like fish that are red in color and eat a lot of shrimp in their diet. Um, and if you decrease the uh, the shrimp in the diet of the flamingo, which varies, and it also depends on the type of shrimp as well, the flamingo will change color. So there are different colors in different parts of their range, but that's owing to the fact that they've got different diets, not to the fact that they have genes for different color. Okay. Um, and then finally... What's this cat? Siamese cat. Good, good, good. Okay, so I hit you with the tough one first, the hydrangea. Um, yeah, the Siamese cat essentially has um, a protein uh, that leads to uh, a protein that will break down when it reaches a certain temperature. And that protein, when it reaches that certain temperature, will prevent... Uh, the deposition of melanin. It's actually very similar to the Labrador Retriever example, except that it's, it's temperature-based. So the warmer parts of the cat stay light because it denatures the protein and there's no melanin deposited. And then basically the colder parts of the cat get dark, right? So you can run an experiment. You can, you can, you can take your Siamese cat and throw it in a refrigerator for two weeks and it's, and it's color coat. No, you can put little booties on it. Okay, you don't have to kill the cat. You can put little booties on it and its feet would turn lighter. And if actually, if you observe your cat closely, does anyone have a Siamese cat? No? Okay. Jeez, you guys, what's up? We did well with the dogs. Um, Siam if, you put, if you observe your Siamese cat closely, you'll notice that it actually changes colors for the seasons as well for the same reason. When it's hotter, it gets lighter. Okay. Lots and lots of environmental inf influences on the phenotype. And in fact, many aspects of the phenotype, as we think about human beings, are the result of a combination of genetics and environment. Okay. So we talked about height for example do you have genes for height yes you do if you come from tall parents you're more likely to be tall but without proper nutrition or let's say you're in a car accident you're not going to be very tall right that's how it works so something like height is a good example of a combination of a genetic disposition and uh you know an environmental influence okay and um people who study this if you look at this in psychology if you study this in psychology, um, they do a lot of studies of this type. But there are people who are sort of in the business of estimating uh, the percentage of a trait, character, or characteristic that is genetic versus environmental. And the measurement of the percentage of a trait that is genetic versus environmental is known as heritability. And it's expressed as a percentage. So if a trait was 50% heritability, it would mean that it came half from environment and half from genetics. Okay. Um, and how do you study this sort of thing? Well, one way you do it is actually by uh, utilizing identical twins as research subjects. Uh, because identical twins have identical genomes, which means that any differences they have must be from environmental distinctions. And, and researchers who look at heritability are not only fond of identical twins as research subjects, but what they really want is identical twins separated at birth, which there aren't that many identical twins that are separated at birth, but it does happen. Um, so they look at all kinds of different factors. Oftentimes they're, they're focusing on things like the occurrence of disorders, you know, so what percentage, you know, what, what heritability factor does type 1 diabetes have? Well, you know, it used to be assumed that type 1 diabetes, which is the child onset type, the kind you get when you're a kid, that that was 100% genetic. It was genetically determined. It doesn't turn out to be the case, actually. So it turns out that identical twins, oftentimes one will have type 1 diabetes, the other one doesn't have it. And it turns out that it really only has a 50% heritability factor, which was something of a discovery, actually, 
because it was assumed to be genetic. Type 2 is the one that you get when you sort of don't exercise enough. You get heavy and you sit around a lot, and then it comes on when you're older, so they call it adult and onset diabetes. That was not assumed to be totally genetic. Everyone knew that it had a lot to do with how much exercise you got uh, and, you know, your diet, right, that that was a big part of it. But the child onset one was thought to be purely genetic and doesn't turn out to be the case. Okay, particularly psychology, they talk about heritability more. Uh, a lot of people look at, you know, people that do heritability studies study things like schizophrenia. Uh, there are heritability studies of things like homosexuality. Uh, anything that people are kind of curious where something comes from and how it, how it occurs in a population. So heritability is an attempt to sort of like come to terms with this nature versus nurture debate, basically. Okay. All right. Um, That'll work for laws of inheritance. Let's go through the molecular stuff for a while. And because um, this is, there's some things I need to sort of provide you with before you watch the film that'll help you understand the film. Again, a lot of these definitions are on your key terms with definitions list. Okay. Um, a few of them aren't, so you're going to need to write a few of them down. Uh, first of all, there's a basic distinction of living organisms into what are called prokaryotic and eukaryotic types. And prokaryotic are single-celled and eukaryotic are multi-celled. Okay, you are a multicellular organism. Uh, eukaryotic organisms have cells that are nucleated, which means that there is a nucleus in the center of the cell. This is not the case with prokaryotic organisms. So there's basic distinctions in cell structure between these two types of organisms. And the cell structure that you're probably familiar with because you studied it in high school biology or perhaps a bio class here is going to be the eukaryotic type. And that's actually what we're focusing on too because it's a class about humans. Okay, But it's interesting because evolutionary theorists feel, at least some of them, um, one called Mark Ridley, who's sort of a leading evolutionary theorist, feels that the point in evolutionary history when the more complex cell structure of eukaryotic cells evolves was an extremely unlikely moment. And in fact, he asserts that biochemically it is less likely than the origins of life itself that this, this development of a more complex cell, and we'll talk about some of the ways that it's more complex and what this actually means, um, but you never would have had the evolution of, of complex, higher order life forms like humans without this step, because this type of organism is simple. So in order to get to anything that we think of as you know animals and plants and so forth, you've got to move to this type of cell. But it's rather unlikely. It's an unusual occurrence, okay? And I'll, I'll explain at least one facet of why it's unusual in a moment. Okay, a couple of human cell types. We've talked a little bit about this. I think gametes and zygotes are on your list. Uh, somatic cells, any cell forming the body of an organism. We make a basic distinction between somatic cells and sex cells. Somatic cells are everything besides sex cells, and sex cells we call gametes reproductive cells such as sperm and egg and animals. When an egg is fertilized, we call it a zygote. <coughs> it divides after it's fertilized through a process called mitosis, which we will discuss in a few minutes in a little more detail, and becomes what we refer to with humans um, and animals as well as an embryo as it develops. So these are some just basic categories of cell types you be familiar with. So zygote refers to fertilized egg, and that's why when I showed you those twins uh, in the last class, I said they were dizygotic, meaning they came from two different eggs as opposed to one. Identical twins are monozygotic, meaning they come from a single egg. And monozygotic twins come from a single egg when that egg divides and becomes two individuals early on in the process of development. It's not that there are two sperm. 
If there were two sperm, the kids wouldn't look the same. So it's the same sperm and egg. It just divides into two individuals early on in the process, and then they both develop. That's what identical twins are. Um, okay, so postzygotic development of humans goes like this. You've got an embryo, which is a multicellular eukaryote. In humans, it develops into the fetus. What we call a fetus is the developing mammal after the embryonic stage. This happens before birth. And generally speaking, among humans, we mark the distinction between embryo and fetus as occurring in the eighth week, which is when organ systems specialize and become formed in the, in the developmental process. So the organs become differentiated around this time. Um, it takes, I mean, it doesn't happen all at once, but it happens over time. And once that happens, it's a fetus. You might have wondered, or if you ever thought about it, what the difference between embryo and fetus are. People use these words. We hear them all the time. This is what the difference is. And I have to say that, I mean, if you have, I mean, if you were wondering about sort of the ethics of abortion and what the scientific position is on this, there's no way to really take a scientific position on it. You know, life starts at the point when the merger between the egg and the sperm happens once the gamete becomes a zygote. Is that the spiritual beginning of an individual? Science has no position on that question. Um, you know, is, is abortion... Uh, something that's ethically questionable or undesirable. Again, there's no position on this in science. The one thing about uh, that's interesting from the scientific perspective is is that it's natural for zyg a zygote not to actually develop into an offspring for a variety of purposes. That is to say that the body of the female itself will prevent this development from happening if it doesn't go according to plan, which it often doesn't because the developmental process is, is fragile. Okay. Uh, the structure of a eukaryotic cell looks like this. Um, and one of the things that's notable about the eukaryotic cell is not just that it's nucleated. This is the nucleus here. Uh, the nucleus contains all of the DNA in each cell. But it also includes a number of other little organelles little features that do things, okay? I don't care if you know all of this. There's only a couple of things about cells I want you to know, okay? Um, one is the nucleus, obviously, okay? That's the center of the cell. It contains uh, DNA, and it plays an important role in, in some of the things we're going to talk about soon. Uh, it's an important structure. Um, another one that's important to know is... Um, uh, for our purposes is what's called the cytoplasm, which is basically this whole area outside the nucleus in which these organelles exist. It's not marked on here, but it's sort of like everything outside the nucleus. And finally, the last one I think that's worth uh, knowing for our class purposes is the mitochondria, and the plural of it is called mitochondrion, or mitochondria is the plural, mitochondrion is the singular. And they produce sort of the energy of cells. They're like the energy-producing factories. Interesting thing about mitochondria, and the reason why they're important in our class, is, is that mitochondria actually have their own DNA, separate from your somatic DNA. Their DNA is much, much simpler, okay? And they are simpler organisms. But the fact that they have their own DNA means that at some point in history, evolutionary history, this organism was a separate organism from the cell it is now a part of, okay? And something happened to bring this, to, to, to make this part of the cell, and this is precisely what the definition of eukaryotic cells are, that they have these complex features, Okay, so what you're seeing here is actually the merger of two separate organisms. Now, the DNA of a mitochondria is quite important when looking at um, populations. 
So it's simpler, it's inherited maternally from the mother to the child, and if you compare DNA, uh, the mitochondrial DNA, which is written like this, mtDNA, um, if you compare the mitochondrial DNA of even closely related individuals, it'll be slightly different. And so mitochondrial DNA is really an easy way of telling how closely related people are. So for example, if you send a cheek swab to a company to find out about your heritage, um, generally speaking, they will look at the mitochondrial DNA. Some of them now actually will, will evaluate your whole somatic DNA, but that's much more complicated and more costly. If you're paying less than about 150 bucks, they're just looking at your mitochondrial DNA. They can tell a lot from your mitochondrial DNA, um, so it's useful. Uh, but the ones that will tell you like things like whether or not you have a strong health risk for cancer that generally cost about a thousand if you want to do that project, um, those will be looking at your full somatic DNA. And the reason why they cost more is that's more difficult. Uh, but the mitochondrial DNA is quite good for looking at how closely related populations are, like which peoples in the world are the most closely related. Who, you know, I'm an African American. Who am I related to in Africa? Who are my people, right? I don't know this. It's been lost. So I can check, I can figure that out by looking at, you know, uh, uh, my cells, looking at, and you just send a cheek swab into a country, into a company. Um, the biggest one is called African Ancestry Inc. And that's the one that Oprah pushes. <laughs> Oprah did it. A lot of people did it. A lot of people did it. It's an interesting thing if you're interested in your heritage. Um, yes, what's your hand up? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, so is that, I mean, does that mean that the development of uh, prokaryotic cells to eukaryotic cells has specifically to do with, uh, in, like, with the incorporation of the mitochondria? Yeah, but it's also specialized functions like the nucleus, which doesn't result from an exterior organism. So there's a series of things that happen, and they go, it goes way, 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 way far back in evolutionary history, because everything that's got uh, a eukaryotic cell evolved after this change took place, which means, you know, what we think of as, you know, you and your Labrador retriever or whatever it is. I mean, everything is, is basically contingent on this, everything that's not prokaryotic. This is still like a very, like, this is definitely a step on from to becoming eukaryotic. Yes, this is one of the necessary steps to that in that process, but it's only one of a number of things that had to have happened, yeah. And I'm not, I'm not an expert in this field, so I can't tell you what, you know, the scientific evidence suggests the order in which these things occurred is. Um, uh, and for that, you'd have to talk to a cell biologist, I think. Yes? Can you write the name of the outside of the cell on the board? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I just told you that. I didn't write it down. I never think of these things. Uh, it's called a cytoplasm. I think it, this comes up in the lecture in a few minutes, C-Y-T-O-P-L-A-S-M, cytoplasm. And, and the reason why it's important is because the information that's contained in your DNA has to get out of the nucleus in order for the cell to do things like produce proteins and all of this. So it's, it's carried out of the nucleus by RNA. Remember, there's DNA and there's RNA. So it's carried out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, and that's why you need to know what the cytoplasm is, because it concerns this process of what's called protein synthesis. But let's, let's get there when we get there. Let's start with DNA. Okay, everybody's sort of familiar with what DNA is. Uh, it's shaped like what they call a double helix, which is like a twisted ladder, basically. And DNA is essentially like a language. And... Um, the best way to understand genetics is to think of it like a book, okay? So inside of every cell in your body is all of your DNA, which is a blueprint for making you, okay? It is the instruction manual for making you. That's the way to think of it. So inside of all your cells is an instruction manual. It's composed of three billion base pairs, which are the rungs of the ladder. So it's like a really long, tiny piece of thread wound up inside of every cell. Okay. Um, so 
the blueprint of you we could call a book. This is the book of you. Okay? And the book of you, what we're going to do is illustrate what genetics are using a language metaphor. Language and literature. The book of you is known as your genome. G-E-N-O-M-E. -E. And that's the entire blueprint for making you. People talk about the human genome too, meaning like what instructions are necessary to build a human. That's a general idea though, because there is no a human, there's only specific people. So when they sequence the human genome, they use the genetic material from a number of individuals and they put it all together and said, this is the human genome. But every little part of it has to be from one individual or another. And while we share a great deal of our blueprint, because we're quite similar, nevertheless, each of us has differences in our genome. They're very, very tiny in the scheme of things, but they're there, okay? Species obviously have bigger differences. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The further the further you are in terms of how you are related to another species apart, the greater those differences are. But again, to put things in perspective, you hear this 98.7 percent of DNA share between humans and chimps, right? You share 40 percent of your DNA with a fruit fly, okay? Which I sometimes hope when I tell my students that it'll prevent them from killing animals needlessly, but it never really does. You're really swatting your brother. Right? The only people that feel that way are animists and Buddhists. Everybody else just kills everything. Um, but yeah, you're 40% of a fruit fly too, which is almost more remarkable than the 98% chimpanzee, because at least a chimp sort of looks like you. What this means, of course, is, is that you and other living organisms share a great deal of genetic material. And this is, this is a critical point, actually, which will be taken up in the film. Okay? But let's just say your genome, this is a G, is the book of you. Okay, now the book of you is written in a language, right? Um, it's not English, it's DNA ease. Okay, so this is a language, and I don't care if you know that C's, G's, A's, and T's are cytosine, guanine, adenine, and tynine. Um, that's, you don't need to know that, but do know that the C's, G's, A's, and T's, which form the rungs of these ladders, constitute the letters in the alphabet, okay? C's, G's, A's, and T's are the alphabet, okay? Um, they are the bases, and they are paired up in a, in a particular way. So you always, in the structure of the DNA helix, get C's and G's and A's and T's together. They can be on opposite sides of the rung that they form when they combine, right? So you can have the C on this side or on this side. But whenever you have a C, you find it with a G. Whenever you have a T, you find it with an A, okay? This is quite critical because what's going to happen when cell division takes place is that the DNA is going to replicate itself. Okay, so one cell becomes two cell. Let's say you scrape your finger, right? Your skin is going to, skin cells are going to multiply, and that's what healing is. It's going to, your skin is going to produce new cells that are going to heal whatever you've scraped, right? In that process, the cells you've already got are going to split in two and multiply. This process happens all the time. You don't have to, you know, scrape your finger because you're constantly losing cells and they're constantly regenerating. Um, but in any case, when that happens, the DNA splits and it's able to replicate itself because free-floating pieces of it will line up with their corresponding opposite. In other words, it cuts in half and for every C, a G will attach, okay? And new pieces are produced in the cell nucleus and they, they are, therefore will form two new strands. There's an upcoming overhead that illustrates this, so you'll, you'll get it. But for the time being, let's say the letters of the alphabet are these bases, the rungs of the ladder, uh, and that's the C's, G's, and A's, and T's, okay? Um, there's a phosphate sugar structure along the side of the ladder, but what's really important is this information that's contained here, okay? All right, that's DNA, first step. Now, here's some facts about DNA. DNA is a large organic molecule, 
It stores the genetic code. It's composed of sugars, phosphates, and bases in a double helix-shaped molecular structure. Human genome has about 3 billion base pairs. And the reason why there's so many of them, there are two reasons why there are so many of them, two main reasons. One is, is that a lot of the DNA that you have in your genome is what's called non-coding or junk. You've heard this junk DNA expression. So non-coding DNA does not have any coding function. It's just there. And if it doesn't code, that means it doesn't have any impact on you. That means it just sits there. And that's fine. No impact, it might as well build up. Some organisms that are actually remarkably simple have even more junk DNA. In fact, the most complicated genome of any creature on Earth is an amoeba, which has six billion base pairs. Now, an amoeba, probably not as interesting on a date as you are, but still, twice as much, twice as many base pairs in its genome. Uh, the simplest genome of all vertebrates is the pufferfish. Back to Nemo we go. Uh, and the pufferfish, because its genome contains so much less junk DNA than other animals, is the source of a massive research project. Geneticists are trying to understand how it is this particular creature seems to lack junk DNA. Now, in general, plants have bigger genomes than animals, and it's partly because the way plants reproduce particularly lends itself to the production of greater amounts of junk DNA. So their genomes just tend to be larger in general. The point here really is, is that just because you're a complex organism, top of the food chain, whatever you want to say, doesn't mean you have the most complex genome. That is not true. Okay? The complexity of the genome doesn't have anything to do with you being a specialized creature with higher brain functions and all that stuff that people do. Okay? Um, segments of DNA in what are called chromosomes correspond to specific genes. If this is not clear, it'll become clear because I'm going to show you a couple slides that kind of make this clear. The film as well is, uh, does a nice job of explaining certain aspects of this final point. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next, this is the slide where uh, I began describing to you uh, DNA replication. What do with my... Where is my little thing? Here it is. Um, so what happens when cells multiply is they divide. You have free-floating sugars, phosphates, and bases that will actually line up as the DNA strand unzips. They will find their corresponding opposites and form two new strands of DNA. Those then split into two new cells, and that means each, the old cell and the new cell, are both containing an entire version of your genome. And that's going to be true of somatic cells in general. It's not true of gametes, however, because remember what happens in sexual reproduction is that you're going to pass on half of your genetic material to your offspring. So unlike your somatic cells, your gametes only have half of all your genetic material because it's going to combine with somebody else's to form an offspring. Okay? That's the main difference <coughs> between somatic cells and, 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 and gametes. And it's also the difference between mitosis and meiosis which is our next slide. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that. It's like I'm psychic. It's almost like I wrote this lecture. Oh, my God, I did. Uh, okay, so mitosis and meiosis, you might remember. Um, again, this is not a cell biology class, so I'm not expecting you to, to know everything about everything. But know, know a couple things. First of all, that mitosis produces somatic cells and meiosis produces sex cells. This is critical. And the basic division is, is that when cells replicate, the DNA material in their nucleus becomes organized into what are called chromosomes. Okay? Now, the Book of You has a bunch of chapters. In fact, those chapters, which we can call chromosomes, are how many in number for a human being? How many chromosomes you got? You have 46 or you have 23 pairs because they pair up during the cell division process. So basically we can say you've got 23 chapters or 23 pairs or whatever you want to say, 46 chapters. Let's say you've got 46 chapters in your book. 
different different number of chapters for different organisms in their in their book. So chapters of the book we would call chromosomes, and basically chromosomes are simply a way that the DNA organizes itself during cell division. Ordinarily, when cells aren't dividing, the, the, the DNA material in the nucleus is not organized into chromosomes. It's just in there in pieces. Okay, this, They will organize this way when cell division takes place. So chromosomes aren't always visible. This is an important point. Now, in mitosis, what you have is the kind of replication I showed you on the previous slide where you end up with one stage of division where two daughter cells are formed and each of them are identical copies of the original. Okay, And this happens as the DNA will unzip, free-floating nucleotides, phosphates and sugars will form an identical strand of DNA based on the two opposite halves of the unzipped piece and then ultimately you end up with two identical copies. If nothing goes wrong Sometimes you get little, I mean, with three billion base pairs, sometimes something gets screwed up, actually. And sometimes that's important, as you'll see in the film. Um, in meiosis, you've got a two-stage division. And in the second stage, the division will reduce the number of chromosomes from 23 pairs to 23. And that's how there's only half a complement of your full DNA in your, in your eggs and sperm, basically. And of course, this is going to, re, re, you know, result in gametes, okay? So meiosis results in gametes, mitosis results in somatic cells. That's the main thing to know. Meiosis is a two-part, is a two-stage process, and my, uh, mitosis is a single-stage process, a single-division process. It's actually more than one stage, but a single division, okay? And we've just gone over mitosis and meiosis in literally three minutes and my office mate who is the daughter of uh, a cellular biologist takes something like 45 minutes to give you a much more thorough picture of this of this extremely important process <laughs> I probably would be horrified that I just went through this that quickly but if you don't tell her I won't tell her all right let's move on I got other stuff I want to talk about all right so a couple other processes that play important roles here um, what happens is, remember that chromosomes, if you look at, if you look at um, uh, chromosomes on your, uh, on your handout, it describes them as homologous. Okay? When, the, when your chapters are organized, they, they are organized in pairs. That's why we often describe them as being in pairs. And they're bound by a structure called a centromere which holds them together. It's like a little bundle. And the idea that they're homologous means that the same gene is found on the same place on each of the chromosome pairs. Okay? So remember, you've got two copies, two alleles or whatever. It's different, different copies of the gene. It's not actually alleles. So you've got two copies of, of, of each gene. This is copy A, and this is copy B. Okay? Um, you can think of this as like blood type if you want, whatever. Um, so those two copies are in the same place on each member of the chromosome pair. That is to say they're like mirrors of each other, and that's what homologous means. Okay. Now, when cells divide during meiosis and sex cells are produced, remember you've got 23 of these, so let's say this is chromosome... Uh, six. Now, when you're producing a gamete, you're only going to pass half of this genetic information. That is to say, one copy of everything to your egg. Okay. And what happens is not that either one of the chromosomes or the other goes in total to the egg they break apart and you get pieces from each one, okay? So that's what's important. You get a, you get the, you get a full complement, the equivalent of a single chromosome, but it's not like either 
this chromosome as a whole goes over here, or this one does. If they didn't break apart into pieces and come back together again, your possible results for offspring would be extremely limited because you'd only be donating one of, of each of your chromosome pairs. And you can see mathematically that would be quite limited. You'd only have a s sort of small number of possible children. Right? But in fact, your possibilities are virtually infinite. And that's because what you're going to get is little pieces from each chromosome that will then be passed on to the egg. Okay? So you get a full chromosome, but it's made up of pieces of each of the pairs. And that's, that's a critical part of the process. Okay? That's called recombination. So recombination is the exchange between homologous chromosomes. It occurs during meiosis. That's the production of sex cells, as we said. The chromosomes break apart and then recombine. This produces a novel set of genes for each individual. Okay? So you're going to get half the genetic material but you're not going to get it in the form of a full chromosome. Okay? What happens in reality, however, is, is that genes that are located close by each other on the chromosome, let's say here's A, here's B, here's C, here's D, will be inherited as a unit. So what happens is you kind of get chunks, and sometimes the chunks contain multiple genes. And that concept is called linkage, meaning that certain traits are linked when they're inherited. And now we're back to this idea of you get, you know, whatever, red hair and pale, pale skin, or blonde hair and blue eyes, or brown eyes and brown hair. We talked about this before. These things kind of go together. And that's the result of linkage, okay? Because you're going to get pieces, but the pieces aren't individual genes. They're sort of chunks of DNA, and sometimes they contain more than a single gene. Right? Sometimes they contain genes that have multiple functions as well. We talked about this, right? Pleiotropy. Okay? So you're kind of getting a little bit, a little bit more complete picture here of how these things work. But these processes of crossing over and linkage are critical to, in terms of how they genetically affect inheritance of traits in offspring. Okay? All right. Um, the next critical part of the picture is called protein biosynthesis. And protein biosynthesis is the production of proteins in cells. And this is a complicated process, OK? The complicated process necessitates getting the information that is in the nucleus in the form of DNA out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm where proteins are produced in, an other, in another organelle called the ribosome, which you should actually have a ribosome in your notes as well, and I don't think that's on your handout. So the ribosome is actually the organelle where uh, proteins are produced in the cytoplasm of the cell. Now this is a complicated several step process because the DNA cannot leave the cell's nucleus. Something else has to take the information out of the DNA, and that's what RNA does. RNA will take that information out of the nucleus and bring it out into the cytoplasm and ultimately to the ribosome. Okay, this is an illustration from your book's discussion. Let me give you some other pictures, some more information, and kind of give you a handle on this. Okay, the first step in this process is called transcription. The two, there are two stages. You can write them both down. Stage one is transcription. Stage two, bless you, is called translation. Okay, so you've got transcription and you've got translation. Now, transcription is the first step, and what's going to happen is, is that you're going to have to get that information that cont that's contained in the DNA out of the cell's nucleus, and what you're going to use is RNA. RNA comes in a couple of forms. The first form that you're going to encounter, which is in this first stage, is called messenger RNA, or mRNA. Okay? And mRNA, or messenger RNA, is going to get that information out by using the same process that DNA uses when it replicates. That is to say that it's going to form complementary strands that line up with the bases, basically, <coughs> in terms of their, uh, their chemical structure. So it's almost exactly the same as the replication of DNA, where they form opposites on the basis of the C's, G's, A's, and T's except the T's are replaced by uracil, which we abbreviate U. I mean, it's, it's not, you don't need to know this, but essentially there's some slight biochemical differences in the structure of RNA as a molecule than there are from DNA. Nevertheless, the principle is the same. The letters go together, 
they stick, if you want to think of it that way. It's a structural thing, but they, they stick together, and therefore they line up, and that way they can carry this information out of the cell, which the DNA is not capable of doing. Now, the messenger RNA does not take out the information for the junk. It's only going to be, ta it's only going to be removing that information that's coding, okay? The non-coding sections we call introns, they're removed. Only the coding sections, which we call exons, are still included. Okay? Only, those, only exons undergo transcription. And transcription is the first step in protein synthesis, as we say. Then this messenger RNA passes through the cell membrane, the membrane of the nucleus, into uh, the cytoplasm, ultimately into the ribosome is where it's going to wind up. And that, at the ribosome, the second stage, which is translation, occurs, okay? Now, you're probably sitting here wondering, what is the point of all this? Because I haven't really explained it. I did tell you that it's about the production of proteins, which is quite critical. What proteins do, I will explain when I get to the end of the process, and then you'll understand, like, what it is this is doing. Proteins are the structures your body, uh, body is made of, basically, so that's what it's doing. It's producing the things you need for your body to function properly. Protein's really important. Your mother was right. You should eat a lot of protein. You can also make protein. That's one thing your body is capable of doing, various proteins. This is the simplest representation I have seen in any textbook of this process. The, the, the image in your textbook of the whole thing taking place is more complicated than this. I prefer this one because it's a little bit easier to understand. So the first step, which takes place in the cell nucleus, is the one we've been talking about. Okay, good. Now, here's messenger RNA where the U replaces the T. It leaves the nucleus, goes out here, and what it's going to do, here it is again with its information, is that it's going to break the information into three groups of three letters, okay? And those three letters are then going to be complemented in the same way that this strand lined up with the DNA with the second form of RNA, which is called transfer RNA. So now we're at the second stage of the process. And the transfer RNA will organize the information into three letter sequences, okay? And those three letter se sequences, bless you, for the purposes of our language analogy are equivalent to words, okay? Those words are three letter sequences in transfer RNA, and they are called codons spelled C-O-D-O-N-S, okay? Now, what's critical is, is that each of those three-letter sequences correlates to an amino acid, okay? So, the codons equal amino acids. Now, you've probably heard of amino acids because a lot of people will tell you you should take them as a dietary supplement, okay? And if you've ever asked anybody what is an amino acid, they usually define it in a certain way. Have you ever, does anyone know what an amino acid is, or have you ever heard that, what the, how people define them? You are familiar with them, right? Does anybody take any? What, which one, which would you just take? Who knows? Something somebody said you should take. Oh, it's probably lysine, or, yeah, probably lysine, unless you're taking steroids. <laughs> it wasn't steroids. It was, yeah, it's, lysine is the one that bodybuilders tend to take because it helps you build muscle tissue. Um, basically, the definition that they usually give you of amino acids is that amino acids are the building blocks of protein. You hear this all the time. The building blocks of proteins, right? Well, that's what they are, okay? They're, they're the words. The codons make up amino acids, and those are the words that make up, guess what, sentences that are, guess what, proteins, okay? And that's what's being indicated here. All right, so let me give you a little more explanation so you can understand the process. Here's some definitions. The codone is the three nucleotide base sequence in RNA. It codes for a specific amino acid, okay? An amino acid is a component or building block of proteins. 
There are 20 different amino acids. They combine into proteins, but the number and sequence of the amino acids varies. In other words, the way you create sentences, you mix up the words. That's how it works. A protein is a molecule, and they serve a lot of functions. Those functions can be structural or they can be regulatory. They bond with other molecules. They do things like form the basis of tissues, prevent your body from overheating. I mean, all kinds of things. Protein does, proteins do all kinds of things. And there's about 100,000 of them in the human body that are coded for in your DNA through RNA. So proteins are what your body's made up. They're made up of amino acids. Those amino acids, in turn, are indicated by three-letter sequences, thus are made up of, in this case, RNA, but RNA and ultimately DNA is where the information is stored. So we've only got one missing piece of our language analogy. Okay, we've got alphabet, we've got letters, we've got words, we've got sentences, we've got chapters. What part of a book is not on the board? Paragraphs. What is the paragraph if the sentences are proteins and the chapters are, are uh, chromosomes? That leaves one thing. What is a paragraph? DNA. DNA's up here. It's the alphabet. No. Genes. Genes are the paragraphs. So protein, genes are made up of protein sequences, and in turn, chromosomes are made up of genes. This is a little, it was a pretty tricky little question, don't worry. But that, that completes the analogy. I mean, I, I find this is a very useful way for people who, you know, I mean, I, honestly, I'll reiterate, I did not start my life as a scientist. I was just like you. I'm still not. This is not my research area. I do find it very interesting. But when I went to UC Santa Cruz when I was your age, I took physics for poets because even though I never wrote poetry, that's about how much I knew about science. Okay? And I took astronomy because everyone said it was the easiest science class you could possibly take. And I don't want to know this, but I bet that some of you are here for the same reason. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Oh, no, Derek, we just heard you were a wonderful teacher. That's what we're doing here. I'm going to pretend that was your answer. <laughs> I'm not the easiest teacher for this subject, so you could have done better, but you'll learn more here. This is the big fat information slide. I realize there's a ton of information on this slide. Some of it I've already said, but I just want to make sure you've got it in the notes. I think I've got one more slide, and we're going to call it a day. Translation is the part that's occurring out here. So if it involves tra if it involves tRNA, it's translation. It's the part that takes place outside of the nucleus. That's the second stage. Okay. How's everyone doing on this, sir? No, I want you to know all this. Yeah. This is a, I mean, this is, I'm hitting the c most critical elements of your chapter reading. I don't know if you've done the reading for the, for the genetics portion of the book, but basically what I'm doing in this lecture is paring this down, and the, and the handout as well is paring this down to sort of the minimum knowledge you need to understand this. So yeah, I do want you to know what's, what's on the board. But this is a good guide for genetics. Stick to studying what I've done in lecture and that handout, and you'll you'll be okay. That's that's this is this is sort of my little version of this. There's a lot more to say about that. You take a class, you can talk about this for a whole semester. Yeah. Yeah. Use the study questions that are in the book for that. Those aren't in the test study guide. I just let you use the questions that are in the book. Yeah, well, the, the articles for annual editions have study questions at the back, and that's what I take my questions from. Oh, and you know, another question I didn't actually answer when we were talking about the test. On my test, generally, study questions that come from annual editions make up about 20 to 25% of the test. So there's more on lecture in the main textbook, but it, there's enough of it that you don't want to skip it, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay, um, a couple more points to make. You don't have to write this down. Don't freak out. Um, 
One thing is, is I told you that there were 20. <laughs> don't write this all down. You have to know every one of these. Right? It's easy to keep them all straight, right? They all look exactly the same. Uh, okay, so there are 20 amino acids, right? But what happens is when you combine all the letters, right? Because you've got, these are like license plates with three letters. And you've got four different letters. You combine all together. And mathematically, you've actually got way more three-letter combinations than you have uh, then you have amino acids. There's only 20 of these, but there's 64 of these, which means that a number of amino acids, almost all of them, in fact, with few exceptions, are indicated by more than one three-letter sequence. And this is absolutely crucial, because what happens is, is that in the process of cell division and ultimately meiosis, you get little mistakes. They're called mutations, right? A mutation for our book analogy, is a misspelling. You can think of a mutation as a typo in your book. Now, the cool thing about the way this all works is, is that if the typo, and there's an error that happens, changes, say, here's lysine. You can't read it. But lysine has basically two, you know, um, two uh, uh, messenger RNA triplets that can indicate it. One is AAA, the other one is AAG. It doesn't matter which way that's spelled. It's still going to give the same instruction to build the same protein and ultimately doesn't affect your genetics. So you can make this misspelling, and it has no impact on your phenotype. Do you get it? So remember, amino acids, which are listed here, are the building blocks of proteins. They are spelled with these three-letter codones, right, the words. But the word has a couple different ways of spelling. So that means you don't have to be perfectly careful with how to spell your words. And some mutations do not have a negative impact or negative outcome because of the fact that there are different spellings for the different amino acids. OK? And let's stop there. We'll pick up with that one next time, you guys. We'll finish this up on Monday.